You're live now. Welcome to the SNEA for System Memory and Computational Storage Summit 2021. My name is Mike Heumann. I am the managing uh, partner of G2M Communications and G2M Research. Uh, the, uh, our panel discussion today is going to be on the benefits of computation and CSDs, CSAs, and CSPs. Uh, a couple things on how to participate. First of all, if you have uh, questions, we definitely welcome questions. Just use the Q&A button in Zoom and you can enter your question there. And then we'll address those at the end of the session. Um, and you can also see whether, whether other attendees liked your question. So please feel free to upvote your question or, or upvote your friends' questions or downvote the people that, that aren't so nice to you if you want. Um, we'll try to get as many of the questions answered as possible. And you can also connect with the panelists via the Slack channel during the event. And we'll have a post summary evaluation survey. We definitely like you to fill that out if you get a chance. So, you know, if you think about uh, what we're going to talk about here, and I'll get a little bit more detail on this, but computational storage really introduces a variety of interesting questions. Uh, we've got a variety of uh, experts here. We'd like to talk about some different facets of computational storage. What are some of the barriers to adoption? How can customers approach those? And where does it go in the future? So with us, uh, we have as our panelists, J.B. Baker. J.B. is VP of Marketing at Scaleflux. We have Sean Lundy, who's VP of Business Development at Ideacom. We have Jason Mulgard, who's Principal Storage Solutions Architect at ARM. Bill Martin, who is the co-chair of the SNEA Technical Council and Principal Engineer of SSDIO Standards at Samsung. And finally, Eli Tionkin, VP of Business Development at NGD Systems. If you want to find out more about computational storage uh, and computing and memory, you can go to any of these sites here. Uh, these will also be in the notes that you should get at the end of the session, so you can look at those as well. So let's talk a little bit about computational storage. So it's really part of a trend called, we can call it the disaggregation of computation. For those of us who are, are, are really old and gray, which is probably most of us up here on the panel, we remember the days when computation meant an x86 CPU in your server, and that was pretty much it. Now, if you look at today, it's really that, that computational task is sprawled way beyond just the CPU itself. Some of the new devices that it's included in are computational storage devices, or CSDs, computational storage arrays, or CSAs, and computational storage processors, or CSPs. And all these devices have the same concept, which is let's offload the CPU of certain things that are better done next to the data. And that's really what computational storage is, is about in general. It's kind of like Apache Hadoop, but at a more granular level. Instead of moving the data to the device, you want to move the device to the, to the, to the processing to where the data is at. So we've got about six questions we're going to ask our panel today. Um, you can see them listed here. We'll talk a little bit about what are the differences between CSD, CSA, and CSP? Why are there so many different form factors? And what, what are the uh, what are some of the rationales for those? What are the use cases and pain points that computational storage uniquely solves? What are some of the barriers to adoption? How can customers approach these to successfully adopt computational storage? Uh, and then a little bit about um, some deployments that each of our different uh, panelists have actually been involved with and some of the benefits of those deployments to the customers. And then we'll talk a little bit at the end before we go into the Q&A about where does computational storage go in the future especially related to GP, GPUs and AI and EPUs and things like that. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with the first question. I'll leave the question up for a second, then I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen. But that first question is, what are the differences between CSD, CSA, and CSP, and what are the benefits of each? And we'll start with JB Baker at Scaleflux, and go to Sean Lundy at Identicom, then to Jason at Arm, Bill at Samsung, and Ellie at the end. And for each question, we'll rotate the order so everybody gets a chance to be first. So go ahead, JB, and take it over. Okay. So you know you saw the what the acronyms mean there. So the the CSA is the array, the P is the processor, and the D the drives. Uh, and really, it's the the primary difference in these is just what level of integration you have. So in the in the CSP, you've got the compute functionality there with with processor, but no integrated storage. 
with the CSD. Now you've got the compute integrated with the storage media. So they're all together in a single device. And then in the CSA, you're probably, you're combining multiple functions, uh, multiple drives, multiple processors together into, you know, a, a system level solution. And I think that's, uh, you know, going back to the, to the CSA, then it's, in terms of differences across these, a CSA may allow you to, to deploy more functions in one thing that you bought. So one solution from the vendor can, can have more functions in it because it's got more space and more power, you know, bigger envelope there. Um, in the CSP, you've got more power that's available for running the compute, but you're not including the storage. So you may be able to do higher levels of or more compute functions in the CSP. Uh, but now you're, you're running into potential bottlenecks with transferring lots of data to that CSP in the first place. In the CSD, you're going to have limited resources available for the compute functions. So it's going to um, be a mix of hardware engines and uh, programmable resources there. But it's all going to stay within the power envelope of an ordinary NVMe SSD. Um, so those are some of the, the key things that, that we see. Cool. Sean, what do you have to add to that? Yeah, so I don't want to. I don't want to repeat what JB said. He did a good job of describing, I think, the differences between what makes up a CSP, CSD versus CSA. So maybe I'll just focus more on some of the pros and use cases associated with each. So for the CSP, um, I think the main pro associated with this one is its ability to disaggregate and independently scale compute and storage resources, uh, leading to reduced storage costs. I think on the CSD where you get the advantage is its scalability for larger flash array type applications. Another big advantage of the CSD would be its reduced data movement. So that would be a big one there. And then on the CSA, it's obviously, its pro is that it's a self-contained and managed system. So you've got a fully validated hardware and software system all rolled into one. So where the use cases will cross or differ in each case, I'd say for the CSP, what we mainly see is use cases around file systems that charge data across drives or databases that use striping to improve disk performance. Whereas on the CSD, we see search at rest type applications where you're searching or tagging data or audio or video, which could be compressed or encrypted, and um, even use cases around AI inference in, in next-gen vehicles, for example. And on the CSA, the type of use cases we would associate with that is accelerated applications like file systems and larger databases. So that's the kind of some pros, some use cases of each one. Brilliant. Jason? Yeah, well, I, uh, great answers from JB and Sean. So definitely don't want to repeat everything. Um, I, I think that uh, so not a lot to add there, I suppose. Um, I think that you know, certainly that the, the one thing to really highlight is the, the uh, benefits of not moving the data as all the way to the host. Um, and all these three forms of um, computational storage provide that. Um, and I know that that was uh, stated before, but definitely worth uh, repeating. Um, beyond that, I think that you know everything that JB and Sean provided in terms of benefits makes a lot of sense, and I can't really dispute it. And Bill, what what do you guys see at Samsung as far as the, the differences? Well, so um, I think that what JB, Sean, and Jason have all already said is is equally true for us. I would, from a standards point of view, point out two additional things that weren't actually mentioned to try and just highlight something new and different. Um, the first of them is what makes a CSP really a CSP as, as opposed to just a processor? And the key to it is that for a CSP, it is in some way associated with storage. So it's sitting on the storage bus where it can, while it doesn't have storage integrated within it, it can access that storage on the storage bus. Um, and then going to the CSA, um, the one thing I'd point out is a CSA has a couple of different architectures that can be implemented. Um, one of those architectures is 
you have your computation just in the um, processing of the actual array processor. The other potential, however, is that within the array, you actually have computational storage drives uh, spread across the array. So not only do you have an array processor that presents that as one cumulative piece of storage, you also have that array processor able to present the computation that is distributed across the drives as a single piece of computation to the host. So those are some additional differences. Yeah, no, those are outstanding points, Bill. Thank you. And Ellie, what, what do you have to add to the conversation? So, uh, not, a, not as much, maybe just to uh, summarize on the high level, all of them serve one higher purpose, to move the compute closer to the storage where the data resides. Uh, and for you as the end user, what you should really ask yourself is, what is my infrastructure looks like? What is the applications that I'm running? What problem I'm trying to solve? And based on that, what will be the best solution for me to integrate it with regards to computational storage? Perfect. Let's go to question two. Let me share my screen here again. And question two is why do we have so many different form factors for computational storage? And are, are there specific benefits for each form factor? And, and where do the form factors go tomorrow? We'll start this one out with Sean. And then go to Jason, Bill, and Ellie. Great. It's great to go first, but I'll try not to say it too much so everyone else has a chance to actually say something. <laughs> um, so let me start by saying it's pretty fantastic that we do have a wide selection of form factors because it obviously increases our reach to solve pain points across multiple for our platforms. So today what we mainly deploy on and what we see, and by we I mean everyone on this panel, is U.2, 2.5 inch drives, PCIe add-in cards, EDSF in the form of E1S mainly, and M.2. So each one of these are very necessary and solve a different pain point. Um, for example, some of our customers don't want to give up the PCIe slot, so they don't want to use add-in cards. They love using their front base and they like the serviceability associated with this. Whereas other customers love half height, half length add-in cards and the extra computation associated with that form factor. I think in terms of future, I think what we're going to see is probably a bigger role for EDSFF. So not just E1S, the ruler and other types of form factors around EDSFF. Um, I think another important cross point will be how CXL may use similar form factors, and I expect to see some product overlap here. No, that so makes I'll... perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. Jason, what, what yeah. do you see on? Great. So I agree with a lot of the points that Sean made, um, particularly the last one on CXL. I think that's going to be interesting to see where that goes and how that plays in with some of these form factors. I think that, that power is one of the key items that uh, plays in with the decision on which of these form factors to go with as well. Um, certainly the pain points that Sean highlighted are, are critical. And I think that that power envelope is gonna be instrumental in determining where do the form factors go tomorrow uh, in terms of being able to potentially deliver a higher power envelope to the device um, in order to provide additional compute capability. All right, no, it makes perfect sense. Bill, what do you guys see? So, so I see everything that, uh, that, that uh, Sean and Jason uh, mentioned. I, I think that the, the last point that Jason mentioned is probably a key one of just the fact that depending on what power you need determines a little bit of the form factor that you need. And it really kind of lends itself to the fact that different customer requirements will require different amounts of computation. Um, when you are doing uh, some simple computation that is uh, for the data that's on your SSD, um, you can get by with a much simpler form, a much simpler design, and therefore a smaller form factor, less power. As you get to more complex computation, you may indeed need not only more power, but you may also want more space in the device that you're building. Good point. Ellie, what do you think? 
So if you have, if you're in the enterprise storage space, the, a cloud provider or a, an edge provider, you have different infrastructure that you use. And most of the time when you're trying to enable computational storage, you have that infrastructure already in existence. So uh, what you're looking for in computational storage is to fit right in without changing your ecosystem. So a drop in replacement to the storage or to the slots that you ha already have in the system and take advantage of computational storage. Very good. And JB? Yeah, I, I agree with everybody here. The, and one of the key things, like Ellie mentioned there, is uh, being able to plug into standard slots. So you know, while there are different deployments and different form factors that, uh, that, that each of the players is, is bringing to market, one key thing to note is that we're all basically leveraging pre-existing form factors that have been driven through SSD deployments or uh, adding card deployments, um, you know, array and arrays as well. I'm sure those are gonna comply to standard form factors there. So it's not that we're driving new form factors, it's just we're leveraging the plethora of, of form factors that exist already to hit these different pain points and different deployment models. Yeah, I think even in non-traditional models like embedded um, computational storage, you still see standard form factors being used because it's a lot easier for people to design around it. So that makes perfect sense. All right, let me share my screen. We'll go to question number three. And that question is, what use cases and pain points does computational storage uniquely solve? This time we'll start with Jason. So Jason, go ahead. All right, well, uh, th I think the list can be quite long here and I don't wanna highlight all of them so that way I can give everybody a chance to um, pick some off of their list. Um, so let me just touch on a couple of them for starters. Um, so I, I think that uh, certainly database acceleration is, is one potential area that this can solve. If you've got a very large database, instead of moving that entire database up to the host CPU, uh, you can just um, do the searching right there on the drive or, 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 the, or maybe uh, through a computational storage processor. Um, another one uh, that comes to mind, and, and again, I, I'm just going to limit myself to two so that others have a chance, um, image classification. Uh, so if you've got a, a bunch of images on a drive, maybe you can go through and uh, using some type of ML algorithm or, or, um, or something like that, search through them and, and, and classify them or organize them in an automated way without moving every single image to the host. So like I said, I'll stop there. So that way I can leave lots of opportunities for everybody else to add in more. Perfect. And it sounds like big data is definitely one of the areas. Bill, you want to you add to that? Uh, yeah. So I'll go kind of a different route than what Jason did. I'll go to just kind of the, the high level of what the pain points are. The pain points are data movement, uh, which Jason pointed out with specific examples. Um, and the, the, the data movement is a matter of if you do the processing close to the data, you don't move the large piece of data, you just move your answer. Um, and the second pain point that I would point out is offloading host CPU utilization. So in the case of, for example, um, encryption, rather than do the encryption on the host and then move the data down, you're not really necessarily reducing your data movement, you may actually increase your data movement um, if you're doing compression, for example, but you're moving the compute away from the host, taking some and offloading some of the host computation requirements. Um, so to me, those are kind of the two key things that we're accomplishing with computational storage. And I'll leave it open to others to add more use case specific uses of those. All right, Ellie, I'm sure you've got something you'd like to talk about. Yeah, so, so uh, adding on to, uh, to what uh, Jason and Bill said, uh, nobody's really measuring today the movement of the data. It's something everybody take for granted with today's x86 architecture. And what computational storage really brings to the table is breaking that paradigm. You don't need to move the entire data set to get the essence of the data. And the efficiency level that that brings uh, is tremendous. Uh, so uh, I'd like to uh, maybe touch on the edge. Uh, with 5G coming up uh, and all those IoT sensors, the amount of data that we've seen so far uh, it will be uh, nothing compared to the future. So those two cap new capabilities of 5G and IoT 
will bring vast amount of data and moving all the data even to the cloud just to store it, not uh, even to compute it will be impossible. And that brings the need to store the data, sort the data and do it in the most efficient way. And that's where computational storage comes to play. JB, what do you think? Um, yeah, just to kind of tack on, it is all about reducing the data movement and uh, which that goes up to eliminating bottlenecks. You know, we see that as the, the data sets have grown in size and the data velocity is just accelerating like crazy. And then the CPUs uh, have not been accelerating as, as rapidly with Moore's law slowing down and DRAM being a, a potential bottleneck as well. It's, it's about balancing the system and computational storage helps eliminate these bottlenecks at the CPU, at the DRAM, potentially on the network, on the storage IO by reducing the data movement, by distributing the processing that's gonna be done across a giant data set across many processors. And then um, to like Bill mentioned on encryption, and I think we have already mentioned compression, those are not done well in general purpose processors. They can consume a lot of horsepower. So converting those fixed algorithm type functions that are gonna be done across all of the data to hardware engines makes a lot of sense um, in helping customers scale the performance of their infrastructure. And Sean, what, what do you have to add to the conversation? Yeah, so it's the problem with going last is all the good stuff has been said, but I'll, I'll re-emphasize one thing that JB said and one thing that Ellie said that I, I like, and I, I kind of want to focus on what we're seeing from our customers, not just, I, I want to give you real world use cases that we're seeing today. So on JB's point, like the less sexy solutions like compression, we're, we're seeing a lot of traction around simply offloading storage and compute intensive tasks like compression from storage and cloud infrastructure to hardware based accelerator cards with end solutions around computation storage. So we see a lot of that. Simply, can you offload compression better than what the CPU software version is doing? And the answer is yes, we can. And the other thing big for computation storage, I think, is reduced data movement. It is the biggest movement we see. This is, this is one of the biggest things associated with computation storage. Um, one of the application use cases we see a lot is data analytics where we actually combine multiple accelerators. So compression, decompression combined with regular expression to, to do some sort of search at rest type operation. So that's, that's, that's a big one for us. And then the one that was mentioned initially, we can't get away from it. Database and application acceleration, things like Hadoop, RocksDB, Postgres, MySQL, these are huge pain points that computation and storage will, will solve much better than anything that came before it. Yeah, it, it, the whole conversation reminds me of a number I saw a couple of years ago, I think it was, and, and obviously it's only getting worse, and that was 40% roughly of the energy used in a data center is moving data. It's not doing compute on it, it's actually moving the data. So, you know, and anything you can do to reduce that certainly pays off in multiple ways. So let's jump to question four. And question four is what are the barriers to adoption for computational storage and how should customers approach these? And Bill, we'll go ahead and start with you for that one. So like Jason, I, I have a very long list of barriers to adoption, uh, but also a long list of solutions. I'll try to focus on a couple of those and leave some for others to discuss as well. Um, so to me, the biggest barrier probably to adoption of computational storage is the fact that your applications have to be rewritten. Um, and, and that becomes very difficult, especially if you don't have a common interface to write those to. Um, so the, 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 the follow-up to that is what are we doing about it? Well, within SNEA, we're doing an application programming interface. Within NVMe, there is the development of the protocol layer to be able to make this something that is plug and play for everybody. Um, so th th there is a barrier right now, but we're working to solve it. And 
the, the third part of your question actually is what should customers do about it? The, the thing that I feel customers should be doing about it is being involved in the development of the API to say, hey, does this API actually provide me what I need in order to get my application to interface to computational storage? Um, the second barrier that I want to touch on is security. Um, you're adding a lot to your storage device. Storage devices have a history of having developed security for them, but now we're adding a whole lot of places where you can break security. Um, again, SNEA is working on this with their security subgroup of the computational storage technical work group. Um, that's starting to move forward fairly well. Again, what do you do about it? You get involved and say, okay, here's my security issues. I know what I've done for storage to solve security issues. What do I need to do for computational storage and help be the solution to the barrier? Great points. Ellie. Uh, yeah, thanks, Bill. So I, I will add to what you said that from, from an ecosystem point of view, when you introduce a, a new technology, there's always the ecosystem that needs to, uh, to digest the technology and adopt it. And in order for the ecosystem to do that, uh, having st a, a mutual standards, what the SNEA is doing around computational storage in the technical working group and security is very important and will ease the integration of computational storage. Uh, and that comes along with vendor selection. Right? So customers do not like to have a vendor lockdown. They want to have a few options, second source. And the more computational storage solutions are out there, I think the easier it will be to, uh, to adopt a, from a market a holistic uh, perspective. Uh, and one other point that I would like to, to mention is actually the, the uh, programmability, the, uh, the easiness of taking an application and making it run smoothly on computational storage without really changing your uh, kernel of the operating system or integrating new drivers or making it difficult for the customer. So ease of programming is, is a big one for adopting computational storage. Great, great point. JB? Uh, yeah, kind of on top of what those guys are saying, um, I think there's, <clears throat> with any of the new technologies, there's the, a couple of things. One, the, uh, the promise of where it's gonna be several years out versus where it is today. Uh, and then that perceived complexity out there that's that, you know, it's new, it's challenging, it, it requires me, may, do I have to make integrations? Do I have to make changes to my applications? And the answer is, well, sometimes, um, you know, so, some of the deployments, uh, some of the functions from computational storage can be deployed today without making modifications to your application. Um, or, or other significant integration. It can be done pretty simply today with some of the functions. And then as we get into more of the customers doing programs for the computational storage devices, uh, sure, that's gonna be, we, we need these standards in place and we need the standard programming model so they can take that work that they did and apply it across different vendors hardware. Um, but it's a, you don't need to wait for that, right? You can start deploying computational storage and getting a lot of the advanced, the, the benefits today. Uh, and then these more nuanced and uh, broad or additional uh, benefits you can deploy as, as the standards and ecosystem come out. And, and certainly open source makes that better, right? I think that's always a good point. Sean, yep. uh, what, what have you guys seen with your customers? Yeah, so from, from our perspective, it's similar to what Ellie and JB is saying here. So we definitely believe we need a standards-based consumption model for customers to get the most out of computation storage. I think that's key. So at Adetacom, we, we actually designed our accelerators and software stack around NVMe from the beginning. And there's a lot of work going on in NVMe computation storage right now. And I think that's going to help enable mass adoption greatly. And the other point that Ellie made that I, I want to emphasize too is the more players involved and the more second source options our customers has for any solutions in computation storage, the better. Because what we're seeing is commodity and GSM folks not liking computation storage sometimes because they don't have a second source on the table to beat us up on pricing, for example. 
So we, we, we need more. So more, more startups, more companies, come on into computation storage. We, we, we welcome you. Better to have a, a small piece of a big pie than, than a, the whole, whole of, no, of no pie, I guess. Exactly. And Jason, what do you say? Well, let me first start by uh, touching on the one item that Bill had mentioned on security. I'll use it as an opportunity to put in a shameless plug for a session tomorrow in this same time slot. We'll have a panel on uh, security and computational storage because that is, I think, really going to be a hot topic. Um, and so we, we, you know, SNIA is working on it and, and, and we want you to come help us, if, especially if you're a security expert. Um, so that, that's uh, some, something that we, we need to solve and, and we're going to solve as, as part of SNIA. Um, and then, you know, to, to what Sean was saying, I, I definitely agree with having more. I think that it, uh, along with that, open source software uh, and open standards uh, are, are really going to help make that the, the adoption more palatable for everybody, for all the, uh, the consumers of computational storage. And I think that, that if everybody kind of gets on board with that and, and lots of people come along, uh, then it's going to become easier for everyone to adopt. Perfect. So, so, so let me jump in and add one last thing to what uh, Jason just pointed out. There was also a, uh, a talk earlier today that you can go back and look at that talked about security and computational storage. So as you want to focus on that, you may want to look at that as well. Outstanding. Very good point. Uh, let's go to the next to the last question. That is, can each of you talk a little bit about a computational storage production deployment that your company has been involved in, some of the benefits that your customers saw that, that were uniquely enabled by computational storage. And Ellie, we'll go ahead and start with you on this one. All right, finally, I'm the first one. Uh, so I, I will talk about a, a two different a, a examples, deployment of the, uh, uh, the computational storage devices by NGD systems, and both of them are at the edge. Uh, the first one is autonomous vehicle. So as you know, autonomous vehicle collect a lot of information to, uh, in order to improve the machine learning algorithm of, of these cars. And uh, NGD were able to uh, uh, work with an autonomous vehicle uh, a recorder company that actually collects the data. So uh, the data is collected on a daily basis and that data is enhancing the machine learning of the entire data set that is being collected from each one of the autonomous vehicle uh, cars that are on that fleet. And as the amount of data is massive, the, uh, the ability to sort it as the data is being uh, recorded and, and sorted out is as being a tremendous uh, advantage for, for the customer uh, by reducing the power and compute that needs to be apply to the data once the data is moved to a central location uh, cloud. So that's the first example. Yeah, uh, Ed, Edge is a good, good one, that's a good point. Yeah, this, the second one really came from an, from an unexpected source. It's also a, a sort of an Edge uh, compute deployment and it's actually low earth orbit small satellite. So the last place you think of seeing computational storage come to play. And uh, NGD was selected by the, the US uh, Space Force uh, to demonstrate capabilities of self-autonomy and cybersecurity in small satellites. And uh, the size, the capacity of the drive were very important. The, the fact that it's low power is important, but that actual compute capability of taking images and processing the images on the actual storage uh, it has been a tremendous value for this program. And what we've seen is not only um, uh, military or government type of usage, but also uh, commercial usage with other small sat vendors that uh, uh, were exposed to the, the innovation in the technology and, and are adopting it for commercial types of applications. So uh, it's, it's been interesting that the ability to run Azure Edge OS and AWS Greengrass on the devices help that uh, initiative. And uh, uh, with the space, uh, you know, the sky's the limit. Very good. JB, what are you guys done on your side? Um, we've been primarily, uh, primarily focused on data center. So uh, a couple of key deployments there. One around database acceleration. Um, 
well, actually, they, they both result in database acceleration. But one, I, where, the, where the compute and the storage are co-located in the same uh, unit, you know, hyperconverged there, that by transferring or offloading the compression to the drives, we're able to, the customer was able to extend the, the effective capacity of the drives by 3x, improve the transactions per second that they got per node by 2x, and reduce latency by about 5x. So, you know, what they, at the end of the day, what they're able to do is use half as many servers to achieve the workload that they, um, that they had. Uh, and then the second part of database acceleration was a, a data filtering. And this one we can be public because we've published the paper co-authored with Alibaba Cloud, uh, where offloading uh, filtering of the data, the predicate filtering into the drives for remote storage that is then being accessed by multiple compute nodes. The key thing there was not just reducing how much data the, the CPU sees to complete the query, but how much data had to go across the network. It was like a 90% reduction in data traffic across the network by doing that filtering in the disaggregated storage. And given that network congestion is a huge issue for a lot of the hyperscalers, that's gotta be a big one. Yeah. Sean, what have you guys seen? Yes, yeah, so it's hard to it's hard to outdo Ellie here. He just said autonomous cars in space. So I don't know how I'm going to trump that. Nor do I want to. They're actually two of my favorite things. So I, you have cyborgs or something like that. Or... I, I tip my hat to you, Ellie. I, I like those examples. And so the application I'm going to talk about is actually application acceleration in the HPC or high performance computing space. So this is, um, we went into production last year, so this is public, so we can talk about it. Adeticom worked with um, Los Alamos National Labs to accelerate their Luster ZFS-based parallel file system. And we've done that acceleration by offloading um, compute-intensive storage services, like compression, to our no-load storage processor. So the end result of that was, was reducing their storage costs dramatically by effectively increasing their storage capacity, reducing their storage count, optimizing their I.O., and also maximizing their storage lifetime. So we, we did a um, comprehensive white paper in conjunction with Los Alamos National Labs. So go to our website, read that paper, and you'd get a much deeper understanding of the value add. But that's the one I, I wanted to highlight here. I don't want to hijack any more because we got some more people to talk. No, no, really good. That's, that's a great one. Bill, what kind of, kind of uh, deployments do you guys have that have resulted in good customer value? Uh, sorry. Um, so so I, I, I like the fact that everybody has their own unique application. Um, a lot of them are doing the same thing for the system. So what I want to highlight is we have a, a, a deployment with a cyber forensic application. And it actually um, highlights both of the things that I talked about earlier in terms of what are the benefits of um, computational storage. First off, it's offloading the data transfer because it's moving the search out to the end nodes. So you're not transferring the data up, you're doing the search at the end nodes. But secondly, this is being done on an array of um, computational storage devices. Um, so what it does is it also offloads the compute in the fact that the compute is now disaggregated across a large number of drives, allowing the compute to be done on each individual drive, the search to be done on each drive and increasing the, the computational power. The more drives you add, the more power you get. Um, so it is um, increasing performance in both um, not moving data across the backplane and in adding more and more compute power, the more drives you have. So kind of scaling your uh, compute and your, your data. Is a good thing. Correct. And Jason, I think I skipped you. Let me give you a We'll give you an extra minute to talk then. Oh, no, that thanks. Everybody. That's why I was so slow starting. <laughs> <laughs>
No problem. So, uh, you know, as an IP provider, ARM uh, doesn't necessarily have any production deployments, but we are focused on trying to enable all of these deployments that um, have been described to varying degrees with uh, the uh, processors and other IP that ARM develops. So I actually don't need that extra minute. <laughs> so uh, that's uh, <laughs> that's my short answer. <laughs> Save it for the next question. We'll put it on your tab. All here. right, thanks. <laughs> So speaking of that, let, let's jump to the last question here before we go to the Q&A. And that question is, where does computational storage go in the future? I mean, if you look at some of the trends out there, obviously GP, GPUs are doing a lot of processing. We've got AI out there that's spread across a variety of different devices. There's things called data processing units now, which are in the data path. You know, uh, what, what do you guys see as the future? Uh, you know, and, and, and how does uh, computational storage continue to play a part of that? JV, let's go ahead and start with you on this one. Sure, I think um, you know we see that that all of these different types of domain-specific compute are highly complementary. So you know you've got the the GPUs, you've got smart NICs, you've got um, the DPUs, the the CSP and the CSD, and it really you know at first they may seem uh, that they're in competition with each other and there there is some overlap in the functions that can be provided but uh, i think you will see the evolution where certain functions will evolve and say hey this this should be done right in the drive this should be done across multiple drives with a csp or a dpu and this should be done at the array level and and all of the computational storage capabilities Certain, with the reduced data movement, the, the distribution of compute are going to just assist AI uh, and other activities that are being done with the GPUs. Great point. I, I'm sure for a given customer, you know, different customers are going to have different pain points. And you know, the same solution can be used for different things in different places. So and there's, there's definitely not one size fits all. Sean, what, what do you think? Yeah, so it's similar. So, so in my ideal world, like I like to sum it up, like basically what I see is a, a disaggregated, composable and standards based utopia where we actually work in conjunction with GP, GPUs and DPUs to solve the issues that we're talking about today, database acceleration, data analytics and a host of AI ML type use cases. So I think the key to that statement is we work in conjunction, conjunction, not against. I think we are very complementary in what we're trying to solve. And the last piece I want to add is a very good sign of the progress computation storage is making is the fact that the big guns are getting involved, the hyperscalers, the tier ones, the companies you want to be paying attention are doing much more. They're actually actively involved in computation and storage as we speak today. And to me, that is the real checkbox. We have, we have reached a tipping point now where it's not, is computation and storage a good idea? It's how fast we can deploy these end solutions in the real world. Very good point. Jason. Yeah, so I definitely agree with it, that all these different technologies can play together. And I think that that the key is going to be to figure out exactly which compute should happen on which of those types of devices and then and then uh, allocate that um, computational task according to where it needs to be um, uh, deployed and and it may even be that the answer is that it's split where you do some function um, on a, a gpu for example and you do some of it on the the csd um, assuming you had both in a system or, or whatever combination of, of compute resources that you have available to you. you know, that makes a lot of sense, especially if you think about problems like encryption, right? Where you want to do it many places in the system. So it right. Makes a lot of sense. Um, Bill, what do, you, what do you guys think? So, so I agree with everything that's been said. Um, I think that the key here is that each of these technologies um, has its place. It's not that one thing fits all. Um, and even when you come to computational storage, there are certain things that are done better in a certain type of computational storage than in a different type. Um, for example, uh, compression may be done very well based on an FPGA-based type of computational storage, but a database search 
is probably much better aimed at a uh, CPU architecture of that computational storage. So even when you get into what we're calling computational storage today, there's different types of processing that you do, just like you do different processing with GP GPUs, uh, different processing with smart NICs or DPUs, um, and whether those are the same or not is uh, kind of up for debate, but they each have a, have a role in this and they all need to work together. Makes perfect sense. And Ellie, last but not least. Yeah, so, uh, you know, maybe I should highlight that computational storage is not there to replace CPU or GPUs or DPUs. It's there to enhance it, to augment that capability. So when we're looking from a system perspective and we're trying to figure out what is the best way to run a specific application with a large data set, then the question comes, um, how fast the system can run uh, with what the type of power efficiencies and of course, total cost of ownership. And that's where computational storage augment uh, today's uh, other technologies and as we go into the future, I think those capabilities will be even uh, more important and significant. Outstanding. All right, we're getting to the Q&A session now. We've got about 15 minutes. We only have one question. So you can each take a couple minutes on that. And this time we'll switch the order. We'll start with Ellie on it. But the question is, have you considered any potential corner cases where CS could possibly cause performance degradation or induce regressions and data center architectures because of its speed and offload. Usually there's some danger that comes with all the good. I guess it's like when your CPU got faster and all of a sudden you can't run certain applications on it anymore. But Ellie, why don't we start with you? Uh, do you have any examples of something like that or? Yes, I, actually I do. So we have computational storage does not solve the, you know, the entire problem. It's not, uh, uh, it, there, you, you have to consider the, uh, the infrastructure and application in order to apply it. So for example, if you have a very large data set, but you only use uh, one a, a CSD or two CSDs where the, uh, a, they have an ARM processor in, or a few ARM processor in each, then the, uh, you're not gonna uh, increase the system performance. Uh, you need to take advantage of distributed processing. So computational storage will actually make an impact. And we have various examples of you know, servers that are running the same type of, let's say, let's say uh, a gzip de decompression, uh, where the more drive you add, the more impact computational storage is now having both on, on, on adding the performance and reducing the power because now you don't have to move as much data to the host CPU to run that same compression. Uh, so in order to uh, enable computational storage, the data set's gotta be large. And I know large is a very relative term. So maybe I'll refine it. It has to be large in comparison to the memory that you have in that system. Because if you have an all, an all memory uh, a system, then computational storage will not make it, it, will not improve the performance. But with the system, we have a large data set that reside on the storage and the amount of memory require you to move that data in chunks in order to scan through the entire data set. Now adding computational storage to take advantage of distributed computation makes sense. Is there, a, is there a good ratio that you can think of for that ratio? Is it like 10 to one or 20 to one or? The larger the data set, the better. <laughs> good, good answer there. <laughs> That's a rule of thumb. There you go. Okay, Bill, what, what do you want to add to this one? So I would agree with what Ellie said, but I'd also, I'd go back to the last question that we talked about, which is the fact that there isn't one right solution for every problem. Right. Um, you, you need to look at what is your problem and then figure out what is the right solution. And computational storage plays a role. And if you don't do your system architecture in such a way that you determine what is it that I can achieve with computational storage? Uh, yes, you will break the system. Um, for example, if you have a computational storage device that does really great at doing encryption and compression, that same device may not do well at doing a database search. 
and vice versa. If you have something that does well at a database search, it's not going to do as well at um, encryption or compression. And so one of the things we're looking at is the possibility of having different types of computation on a single computational storage device so that you can decide which type of engine do I need to use in order to do my computation. Very good point. Obviously, if you just you know remove one bottleneck and it just opens up another one, that really doesn't help either. So that, that makes a lot of sense. Jason, what do you guys think? Yeah, I, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, it, it, computational storage doesn't solve every problem, but it is part of the solution. And I think that you have to carefully consider what is the problem and how do, what role does computational storage play in that solution versus some of the other technologies as, as Bill had highlighted from our previous question. Sean, I'm sure you have something to add to this discussion. <laughs> Well, I, I would I, I would feel left out if I didn't say something. <laughs> so I, I, I would I'd like to tie it back to actually question number one when we started talking about CSP, CSD versus CSA. So I think one of our roles um, in this is to identify which one of these is appropriate for the customer's use case, because that also feeds into how good the solution can actually be. And it also goes down to what Jason said. There is scenarios, and we've seen this in POCs, where computation storage is not the right answer. The math doesn't work out because in the case of, let's say, compression, the compression ratio based on the data set that we saw just wasn't good enough to justify the end solution. So there will be cases where computation storage is not going to work. Um, we see more cases where that's not true, but that's where other things like GP, GPUs, DPUs play their part. Smart mix play their part. We are, we are one part of the puzzle and a pretty awesome part, but we don't solve everything. Very good. JB, we'll be finishing up with you today. Yeah, I mean, it's I, kind of echoing what the other guys have said. It's it, We haven't really run into a case where it, made system performance worse or you know made things uh, slow things down but we have run into some pocs where uh you get you for the compression offload for example like sean said you get out there and well they the data wasn't compressible in their workload and so there was not a benefit to be derived by adding a compression engine offload um or that the workload was extremely light um that such that the CPUs did have lots of extra extra um, performance, and they weren't. The application wasn't latency sensitive, so the problems that our products help solve were not problems that they had. Uh, you know, they weren't pain points for for those customers. And so it's not that it made things worse, but it just was. You know, we we had a hammer, and they needed a screwdriver, um, kind of thing. So, uh, but you know, we do definitely see that as this ecosystem evolves um, and there's more, uh, more products available, more computational storage functions, as we call them, the, the specific uh, programs or uh, compute tasks that are being offloaded. Uh, as those come to market, we're gonna see that computational storage should be more broadly applicable. Um, and then we'll get that right division of labor as well. So, so maybe handling some of these complex tasks, breaking them up between the different types of, uh, of computational storage devices. Perfect. Well, thank you again, everybody in our audience for listening. I think we had a great discussion. Thank you to our panelists, JB from ScalePlux, Jason from ARM, Sean from Identicom, Bill from Samsung, and Ellie from NGD Systems. Uh, my name is Mike Human. I'm managing partner at G2M Communications. And I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.